storm raged about them, the disciples were afraid. For the waves were high and the ship was tossed, they could not find their way. Then they awoke the Master, saying, Lord, please save us now. He rebuked the wind and the sea grew calm, and they all wondered how. sees the storm from the other side. He knows the lessons learned, and just beyond the clouds he sees clear skies. He speaks peace to the raging storm when peace could not be found. He already sees the rainbow when we see only seemed to me that all hope was gone and I was in despair. I remember what the Lord said when he calmed that troubled sea. And I know once more how he sees the storm and peace floods over me. God sees the storm from the other side. The lessons learned, and just beyond the clouds, he sees clear skies. He speaks peace to the raging storm when peace could not be found. He already sees the rainbow when we see only clouds. And when the storms of life come crashing in and trouble. Let it be, let it be. God sees the storm from the other side. He knows the lessons learned. And just beyond the clouds, he sees clear skies. He speaks peace to the raging storm. When peace could not be found, he already sees the rainbow, when we see only clouds. We're glad you're here this morning. Let's everyone stand this morning, and we're going to sing a chorus entitled, Stand for Jesus. Let's everyone stand as we sing this morning. for looking on this morning as we sing I am resolved
stand on something I want to know I want to know for sure it's something that's going to last forever and uh, that's not going to change and I'm so thankful we have that in the word of God forever oh Lord thy word is settled in heaven and we're so thankful for that great promise great songs to already sing about this morning in church and uh, we hope that you uh, as you're here this morning that your hearts would be challenged and most important we hope everybody in this auditorium knows Jesus Christ as their personal savior and one of the reasons we can know that is because his message from his word what a great opportunity to worship him this morning together let's go to the lord in prayer at this time heavenly father we thank you for your many blessings we thank you for your word the word of god or the bible that we hold in our hands this morning lord thank you that it doesn't change thank you that we can stand on it we can rely on it and even uh, no matter what is going on around us it's, it still stays the same and lord i pray that we would trust it i pray that we would believe it with all our hearts and Lord, I pray you'd be with this uh, time, this hour where we can worship you in song and also a time to give uh, to you through our offering. But most importantly, a time where we can uh, hear from your word once again. Would you stir our hearts? Would you work in our lives, challenge us to take that next step in our Christian walk, whatever it may be. Lord, save the lost. Bring us back closer to you this morning. We just want to tell you we love you and we thank you for your many blessings. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated at this time. If you have your bulletin this, this morning, inside of it is a connection card, especially for our first-time guests. If you would take that, uh, that connection card and fill that out and give as much information as possible on there, and as the offering plate comes around, if you could uh, put that in the offering plate, that would be a help to us. Also on the back side of that is some opportunities to sign up for different activities and also mention any prayer requests that you might have that you'd like us uh, to pray for. As a first-time guest, also on your way out here in the foyer, We'd love to give you a gift, a book entitled Done, that we know would be a blessing and a, and a help uh, to you. And also, I just wanted to take this time in our youth group, in our uh, teen Sunday school this morning, uh, we prayed for one of our seniors. Um, Austin, if you could stand uh, just for a moment. Uh, this is his last service before he goes to boot camp. Actually, today, he'll head out to boot camp. And just please be in prayer for him as he goes to boot camp, uh, not just physically, but uh, pray for him spiritually. Also, we appreciate his courage to, to stand for our country and be a, a Marine. So just wanted to mention him and just uh, pray, be praying uh, for him. Great to have everyone in church this morning. Our choir is going to come at this time and sing a song entitled, Stand Up for Jesus.
two if you're looking on this morning. Who is on the Lord's side? about being on the Lord's side, isn't it? Amen. For those who've just joined our service by means of our radio broadcast on WMAN, we want to welcome you, and we appreciate the opportunity to broadcast our radio services every Sunday morning from 11.15 to 12, and hope you'll stay with us for the next 45 minutes. We uh, had a great week. For those who did not have an opportunity to be part of our vacation, Bible school started Monday evening and went through Thursday evening. We began with 450 some, and by the final evening we had over 600 here and some decisions made for Christ. We'll tell you a little bit more about that tonight, but just want to say to everyone who had a part in the buses and all the activities and, and the speaking, uh, great job. Appreciate all your effort. Here are a few announcements for you. The, those who are having adult Sunday school fellowships after the evening service tonight, there is babysitting available, and you can drop your kids off in the gym. Uh, Brother Baird and his wife and the teens are, will be in charge of that babysitting. There are deacon nomination opportunities in both foyers. If you'd like to take advantage of that, turn those in by next Sunday. July the 9th is a Wednesday, and that Wednesday night for four Wednesdays in July, we are going to be having some electives. One of those electives is Financial Peace University. We did this earlier on uh, Sunday morning at 10 a.m., and now we're having this opportunity again uh, July the 9th, Wednesday, starting at uh, 645 information's in your bulletin on how to sign up for that if that's something that you're interested in a couple other electives that during the that uh, month we're gonna have a parenting elective and then a ladies class as well as the regular service here in the auditorium so make note of that if you would and a big thing i wanted to encourage you about is next sunday morning we begin our bible conference with brother jonathan stewart from down in texas and can't wait for that to get started he's going to be here for the 845 service we'll have a combined seventh grade through all the adult Sunday school class in here and then uh, he'll be here for the 11 o'clock service 5 30 that evening and then uh, Monday Tuesday Wednesday night 7 p.m. hope you are making plans to be here for all of those uh, mountain climbing through the Bible is the title and I, I believe it's going to be a great time and looking forward to that here's a few prayer requests pray for Bill Redden he had surgery this week and a very successful surgery continue to pray for him I was mentioned, pray for Austin Atkins, his family as he takes off for the military. Wayne Herbs went into the hospital uh, today for an elbow infection. Wayne is 94 years old, I believe, so pray for him if you would. 
Bob Stevenson asked us to remember his sister, Vanetta. She has a cantaloupe-sized tumor that they have to remove. She's 86 years old, so he asked us to remember his sister, Vanetta, as well. Let's go to the Lord and ask for his blessing upon our offering this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for our opportunity to gather together, Lord, worship your name through song, Lord, and then through a study of your word. We thank you for each one who's come into your house today, Lord. We thank you for visitors who are our guests today, Lord, and I pray your blessing upon them. I pray that you would meet the needs, Lord, of these uh, ones that have gone through surgery in the hospital for infection, one headed off to the military, Lord, one going in for surgery this coming week. I pray that you'll meet each of those needs, Lord. We ask you to bless the offering in Jesus' name. Amen. everyone stand once again this morning as we sing our closing congregation number this morning page number 391 as we sing this morning a flag to follow
thank you so much. Just before Pastor comes, we have Josiah and Grace Custer to come sing for us this evening, excuse me, this morning. What faith can do. Everybody falls sometimes. Gotta find the strength to rise from the ashes and make a new beginning. Anyone can feel the ache. You think it's more than you can take, but you're stronger, stronger than you know. Don't you give up now. The sun will soon be shining. You gotta face the clouds to find the silver lining. I've seen dreams that move the mountains. Hope that doesn't ever end, even when the sky is falling. I've seen miracles just happen. Silent prayers get answered. Broken hearts become brand new. That's what faith can do. It doesn't matter what you've heard. Impossible is not a word. It's just a reason for someone not to try. Everybody's scared to death when they decide to take that step out on the water, but it'll be alright. Life is so much more than what your eyes are seeing. You will find your way if you keep believing. I've seen dreams that move the mountains, hope that dies. Even when the sky is falling, I've seen miracles just happen. Silent prayers get answered, broken hearts become brand new. That's what faith can do. Overcome the odds when you don't have a chance. But when the world says it can't, Even when the sky is falling, I've seen miracles just happen. Silent prayers get answered, broken hearts become brand new. That's what faith can do. That's what faith can do. First Samuel chapter 17, First Samuel chapter 17, thank you, Josiah and Grace. Today we are looking at the 17th chapter of First Samuel. If you know your Bible very well, you say, I know what's in that chapter. That is David and Goliath. And uh, pretty much anyone who's been in church knows David and Goliath. And a lot of people who haven't been in church have heard the story of David and Goliath. But today we're going to look at this story. And I give you this thought In 1 Samuel chapter 16, in the first half of that chapter, David was anointed to be the next king. He was going to take the throne from Saul. In the last half of that chapter then, of chapter 16, David was then instructed, or he went to school. So David was anointed, David was instructed, and now watch how God moves so that he can set David up to be able to be favored with the people so that he can take over the kingdom. It's amazing how God did this because David anointed, or God anointed David king, and then uh, God allowed David to stand before the king and play his harp and become his armor bearer so he could learn a little bit about the kingdom. And now in chapter 17, 
God makes a way for David to become favored with the people before he takes over the kingdom. Amazing how God worked here. Look in 1 Samuel 17. We'll read the first 11 verses. The Bible says, Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle and were gathered together at Shoko, which belongeth to Judah, and pitched between Shoko and Ezekah in Ephes Damon. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Elah and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side. And there was a valley between them, and there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had greaves of brass upon his legs, and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and one bearing a shield went before him. And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are ye come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine, and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and to kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him... Then shall ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Now look at verse 11. It says this, When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Today's message is titled, David Standing alone heavenly father lord as we open your word and we turn to a chapter lord that's got a very familiar story i pray lord that you would show us exactly what you would have for us lord i pray that we would see possibly our goliath in our life we'd be ready to stand even if standing alone the way david did we ask for your blessing lord in jesus name amen As we open our Bibles and we read the 17th chapter of 1 Samuel, the first verse provides for us four words that confirm the authenticity and the authority of the Word of God. Look in the first verse, if you would. What in the first verse confirms for us the authenticity and the authority of God's Word? You see, if you had a globe up here this morning, and I was to say to you, find Israel on the globe, you'd take that globe and you'd start looking, and you'd have to look hard, and you would finally find a little spot on the globe. But you know what nation makes the news probably more than any other nation? That little nation of Israel. That little nation of Israel is so hated that countries rise up against it, trying to annihilate it. Look in 1 Samuel 17 and verse 1 at the words, which belongeth to Judah. When the Philistines came and they decided they were going to fight against Israel, they gathered together at Shoko, which belongeth to Judah. You know what I like about those four words? Those four words confirm the authenticity and the authority of the word of God because earlier in the word of God, God prophesied through his word that Israel was going to have enemies attacking them all the time because of their disobedience. And guess what happened in 1 Samuel 17? There were enemies trying to attack them and try to, to rid them of their country. Yesterday, The Associated Press had a story. You may have read it. It was about a denomination of churches in America. And that denomination of churches voted to divest from companies that were uh, involved with Israel. Say, what is that? This church group has money that they put in stocks And they made a determination that you should no longer put money, invest your money in companies that are in affiliation with Israel. You know what's happening today 
just like what was happening in 1 Samuel 17 and verse 1, exactly what God prophesied would happen. It's happening all the time. You read the news. If you uh, are in Israel, they're trying to get rid of you. They're trying to wipe you out. If you are friends with Israel, there are those who want to wipe you out. You know what that just confirms for us? The authenticity and the authority of the word of God. It's amazing. But as we begin to study this, the first thing we see is the demand. And that is this, Satan wants what is rightfully yours. Satan is trying to destroy you. He is a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He wants what is rightfully yours. And when it tells us that the Philistines came... And they gathered together at Shoko, which belongeth to Judah. That gives us an illustration that God's chosen people, the Israelites, Satan was coming against them. He wants what is rightfully yours. And then when we get to verse 11, we see, secondly, the dismay. The dismay. Look again when it says, uh, Goliath stood up. He spoke against Israel and the Bible says in verse 11, when Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. In verse 16, it tells us that he had done that for 40 days. And this is the response of the Israelites. They were dismayed and greatly afraid. You know why they were? The Bible says in verse 11, when Saul and all Israel heard those words, words of the Philistine. All they heard was one voice. There was only one voice that was heard and no one was able or willing to stand again. All they heard was the Philistine. All they heard was Goliath. For some reason, they weren't hearing from God at all. From some reason, they didn't have their ear turned to God. All they heard was Goliath. And because of that, they were dismayed. The word dismayed means to break down to become prostrate by confusion and fear, to beat down or terrify. They were paralyzed by fear. And I'll tell you something. If there were no God, if there were no word of God, that's exactly how we all ought to be behaving. Dismayed and greatly afraid. But there is a God and there is a word of God. Without God or his word, this is appropriate, dismayed and greatly afraid. But the Bible says this, what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. We don't have to behave the way that they behave. We don't have to be dismayed and greatly afraid. The demand, the dismay, I want you to see then the first two words of verse 12 says, now David, now David. I want you to see third of all the disconnect because David comes on the scene. If you'll look with me in verse 22, when David arrives there where this is happening, it says, and David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army, came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines and spake according to the same words. Forty days he's been saying the same thing. And David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have ye seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel is he come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king, will enrich him with great riches, will give him his daughter, and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall be done to the man that killeth him. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why camest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the world? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart. For thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? And he turned from him toward another and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. David, David had charted another course. The Bible says in verse 12, Now, David, put your own name in there. Now, David, he had charted another course. And when he heard from the Philistine, he says, 
Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? To David, the filth was plain and repulsive. When David heard from him, he says, hey, we can't have this. He's defying the armies of the living God. The filth was plain. It was repulsive. Is sin that way in your eyes? Two mistakes I think we make. Number one is we no longer blush at sin. Blushing seems to be a thing of the past, doesn't it? Ah, it's not that bad. Ah, I know that movie's got some stuff in it, but it's a good movie. And I, I, ah. What if a few Christians would stand up and say, we're going to do something about this. He's defying the armies of the living God. You know, if we're going to take a stand at that, we begin on our knees. And I ask you to turn, if you would, to Ezra chapter 9. I want to show you a guy who made a determination that he was going to be blush, be ashamed at sin. And he fell on his knees before God. I want you to read with me this prayer of Ezra and consider whether or not we ought to be praying in a similar way. Ezra 9 and verse 5 says this, And at the evening sacrifice... Ezra 9, 5. And at the evening sacrifice, I arose from my heaviness, and having rent my garment and my mantle, I fell upon my knees and spread out my hands unto the Lord my God and said, O oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face to thee, my God, for our iniquities are increased over our head. Our trespass is grown up unto the heavens. Notice the word hour that he uses. Since the days of our fathers have we been in a great trespass unto this day. For our iniquities have we, our kings and our priests, been delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to the captivity, to a spoil, to confusion of face, as it is this day. And now for a little space, grace hath been showed from the Lord our God, to leave us a remnant to escape, to give us a nail in his holy place, that our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. For we were bondmen, yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage, but at hath extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia to give us a reviving, to set up the house of our God, to repair the desolations thereof, and to give us a wall in Judah and in Jerusalem. And now, O our God, what shall we say after this? For we have forsaken thy commandments, which thou hast commanded by thy servants the prophets, saying, The land unto which ye go to possess it is an unclean land with the filthiness of the people of the lands, with their abominations, which have filled it from one end to another, with their uncleanness. Now therefore give not your daughters under their sons, neither take their daughters under your sons, nor seek their peace or their wealth forever, that ye may be strong and eat the good of the land, and leave it for an inheritance to your children forever. And after all that is come upon us for our evil deeds and for our great trespass, seeing that our God has punished us less than our iniquities deserve and has given us such deliverance as this, should we again break thy commandments and join in affinity with the people of these abominations? Wouldst not thou be angry with us till thou hadst consumed us, so that there should be no remnant nor escaping? O Lord God of Israel, thou art righteous, for we remain yet escaped as it is this day. Behold, we are before thee in our trespasses, for we cannot stand before thee because of this. Look how the 10th chapter begins. Now when Ezra had prayed and when he had confessed, weeping, and casting himself down before the house of his God. Maybe it's time for us to fall down on our knees and say, I am ashamed and blush to lift up my face before thee, O God. One of the mistakes that we make, the filth is not plain and repulsive to us because we no longer blush, we just overlook it. It's like standing in the hog pen. I grew up with hogs and cattle. And if you stand in the hog pen long enough, you know what? It doesn't stink that bad. But boy, if you're away from it for a while, yikes. We're like that with sin. We stand there long enough and it doesn't stink quite so bad. We no longer blush. Here's the second thing that we do that keeps us from seeing the filth as plain and repulsive. We never go to the battle. 
We never show up for the battle. Jesus says, look on the fields where they are white already unto harvest. How long has it been since you've gone out into the battle? David arrived to the battle. He had charted another course. He says, how are we going to let this guy defy the armies of the living God? And the filth was plain. It was repulsive to him. And guess what came next? The defamation. The defamation. Here's what happened. David stood up and David spoke. And his brother, his own blood, got mad at him. His anger was kindled against David, it says in verse 28. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why camest thou down hither? With whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride, the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. David's refusal to assimilate or to fit in invited criticism, and that criticism came strong and harsh. Not only did the criticism come strong and harsh, but the source was friendly fire. Don't miss that. The source of the criticism was friendly fire. Do you know you can even be in church and you could take a stand for what's right and you can be criticized by people within? It was his own flesh and blood whose anger was kindled against him and he spoke out against David. So we see the demand, the dismay, the disconnect, the defamation, and then we come to the dialogue between David and Goliath. Look in verse 41. It says, And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, Here is the dialogue. The Philistine says, Am I a dog? that thou comest to me with staves. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And he said, come to me, and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beasts of the field. I want you to look at verse 42 where it says this, and when the Philistine looked about and saw David, Goliath viewed the size and the strength of David. David, though, viewed the size and strength of his God. You see, while Goliath was looking down at David, David wasn't looking back at Goliath. He was looking up at his God. Look in verse 45. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the earth, the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. David wasn't viewing Goliath. He wasn't impressed by how big he was or how heavy things were or the weaver's beam that he was carrying. He wasn't impressed. He was looking up, and when he looked up, he saw the size of his God. And that brings us then to the direction. And that's found in verse 48. Came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. David ran toward and he hasted to do so. He was in a hurry. And he ran right at when the Philistine, it says it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Would you agree with me that in word and deed we see no fear? There's no fear, only a confident desire to fulfill the will of God. One of my favorite parts of this uh, account is found in verse 46. I want you to look with me. When David is speaking, David makes this statement in verse 46. He says, this day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee. And I will give the carcasses, what's the next three words? Of the host of the Philistines this day under the fowls there. 
David says, listen, I'm coming after you and I'm going to get you and I'm going to take your head. But I'm not just going to do that. I'm going to go ahead and just take care of all the host of the Philistines. He was pretty confident in his words, wasn't he? In word, man, was he confident. No fear. But now it's time for the action. And what do we see then? The same thing, no fear. The Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David. David hastened and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. He went right at him. And then we get to verse 49, and we see the decisiveness. The decisiveness, it says this. And David put his hand in his bag and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead and he fell upon his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. The decisiveness. There was a finality in this victory. When David threw that rock and hit Goliath and Goliath fell down, David didn't turn around and say, I got him. I got it. I took care of it. No. He says, I'm going to make sure that Goliath is never a threat again. There was a finality in this victory. Take your Bible, if you would, and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. There may be someone here today. There may be someone who's listening by means of our radio broadcast today. And if you were to be honest, you would say, I'll tell you what my Goliath is. My Goliath, my Goliath is death. It's death. I'm petrified of death. I'm scared of what's going to happen when I die. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, if you'll go to the 54th verse, we read this. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up. In victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't know where your eternal destination is, if there's never been a time that you've come and bowed the knee and said, I know I'm a sinner and I need a Savior, if that's you, You have every reason to have death as your Goliath. It ought to be your Goliath. But you don't have to cower in fear. You don't have to be dismayed and greatly afraid. You know what you can do with death as that Goliath? Hit him in the head, knock him down, and go up, pull his sword out, and cut his head off. And say, death is swallowed up in victory. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's only through Jesus Christ that we can have victory over death, the Goliath of death. And then I give you one last thought, and that is this, the delight, the delight. Go with me back to verse 51 at the end of that verse. It says, and when the the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. And the men of Israel... And of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines until thou come to the valley and to the gates of Ekron. And the wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way to Shearim, even unto Gath and unto Ekron. And the children of Israel returned from chasing after the Philistines, and they spoiled their tents. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem. But he put his armor in his tent. And when Saul saw David go forth against the Philistine, he said unto Abner, the captain of the host, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, As thy soul liveth, O king, I cannot tell. And the, and the king said, Inquire thou whose son the stripling is. And as David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And David said to him, Whose son art thou, thou young man? And David answered, I 
am the son of thy servant Jesse, the Bethlehemite. Notice the words in verse 57, David returned. Ah, oh, the delight of taking a stand for the Lord and letting the Lord work through you. And David returned. He got to stand before the king. It's a little different now. David's a hero as he stands before the king. The king asks him questions. He gets to answer some questions. Can I ask you some questions this morning? Do you have a Goliath in your life? What is your Goliath? Who is it that fits the category of a Goliath in your life? And by the way, don't answer your wife. I had someone in the early service say, as soon as you said, who is your Goliath, I pointed at my wife. No, don't be cutting any heads off like that. Who is your Goliath? Is there, is there that which paralyzes you with fear? I want you to notice something. It may be that you say, boy, I've tried to take a stand before, and when I try to take a stand... I've come under friendly fire. Notice the words of Eliab. When Eliab says in verse 28, he gets so mad at David, he says, Why camest thou down hither? With whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride. And then he says this, And the naughtiness of thine heart. Go back with me to 1 Samuel 16. In 1 Samuel 16 and verse 7, they're looking for who's going to be the next king, and they're going to find David. And guess what they're looking for? God says, I'm looking on the heart. I'm looking for someone with the right kind of heart. And he finds David. He goes, that's the one. And Eliab is poking at David and saying, you got a naughty heart. You know what? You take a stand for the Lord, there's going to be some, they're going to poke at you, and it can be so false, it can be just as wrong as this. I know the naughtiness of thine heart. You don't understand that God just chose him because of the pureness of his heart. God just chose him because he had the right heart, and you're pointing out that he's got a naughty heart. You have no idea. You know what? When you take a stand for the Lord, there are going to be some, they're going to poke at you. They're going to say things that can be so false. But sometimes we have a fear of standing because of what someone may say. Are you paralyzed by fear? Have you experienced or do you fear friendly fire? Let me ask you another question. Is your Goliath a bad habit? You've got a habit. You know it's ungodly. You know it's against the word of God. You're involved in something that you know the Bible speaks plainly against. But I just can't overcome, I just can't. Is that your Goliath? Let me ask you another question. Is your Goliath a good habit? Is it a good habit? Is it something you know you need to be doing? It's something you know you need to be involved in. And you say, ah, that's, that's a Goliath for me. I know I need to be sowing the seed of the gospel. I know I need to be involved in that, but that's Goliath. Let me tell you something. Whack him in the head, cut his head off and begin to get involved in what God wants you to be involved in. Is your Goliath marriage? Is your Goliath rearing children? Is it your children? And you say, listen, I, I'm just having so much difficulty with my children. I, I don't understand this. I, I need, go to God. Look up. See the living God. See the one who wants to be there for you, who wants you to have victory. For some, it may be that your Goliath is finances. Is it finances? You say, listen, I, I cannot get things under control. I spend, I have a credit card, and I just keep putting things on it, and I made a mess, and that becomes your Goliath. It may be you say, I just suffer from depression. Depression just keeps me down, and I really struggle with that Goliath. I don't know what your Goliath may be, but I know that 1 Samuel chapter 17 was put here for us, for an encouragement to us to say, I am going to see filth for what it is. I'm going to see it plain and repulsive. I am going to take a stand. 
it may be that before you take a stand, you need to bow the knee the way Ezra did and say, I am ashamed. I blush to lift up my face to thee. But when we do, we can take a stand the way that David did and we can be successful against our Goliath. It may be that you say, I, I, I've defeated my Goliath before. I've knocked him down. But I have yet to cut the head off. And he keeps rearing his head back up. He keeps rearing his head back up. I read a quote uh, last night. And the quote said something like this. It says, when we refuse accountability, it's a subtle admission that we're going to revisit our sin. Think about that. When we refuse accountability, it's a subtle admission that we're going to revisit our sin. There are some people here, some people maybe who are listening by means of our radio broadcast, and your Goliath may be pornography, it may be things on the internet, it may be things like that, and you keep revisiting it. You keep revisiting it, and you'll conquer it for a little bit, and you just haven't cut the head off. How about today, say, it's time to cut the head off. I need some finality. I need some decisiveness in my victory. I don't know how the Lord may be speaking to you. It may be that you're here and you say, I need to trust Christ as my Savior. I fear death. However the Lord may be speaking to you, let me ask you to stand with heads bowed.